namely OpenShift cluster fleet upgrades, uh, or to be specific, automatic uh, cluster fleet upgrades with confidence. Hi, my name is Gerd Oberlechner. I'm a software principal engineer in, in the service delivery organization of Red Hat. Uh, sadly, a colleague of ours, Mauro Friedman, is not here today. He would have been the brains behind the ideas we're going to present, so we do our best to convey his messages and his ideas. So, hello, my name is Patrick Martin, um, principal engineer as well in the, in the same team. Um, and what we're doing actually is to manage uh, services on top of OpenShift for Red Hat, like Quay.io, console.radar.com, and things like that. So that, that's how we, we end up using uh, clusters, of course, and we need to upgrade them. Indeed, everyone has to like, cycle their, their clusters, and I guess you all agree with that and probably know why. Mostly security, bug fixes, things like that but also new features that, that you want to, to implement and sustainability, like you need to still remain supported by the, the, the cluster owners or the SREs or the provider of your clusters. Usually life cycling a cluster nowadays is not that hard, like upgrading a cluster itself. You usually need to plan, like try to have some kind of schedule to, to upgrade the cluster, to know which version you want to upgrade to, actually upgrade it, and that's some API calls most of the time nowadays. Uh, and then you need to observe to see if the cluster upgrade is going fine, if the workload on top is not having any issue with it, and things like that. So that's quite easy for some clusters. So on, on one cluster, we said it's very easy with one, uh, one API calls, basically. When you have few clusters, integration, stage, production, that's relatively easy as well. You just schedule them in order and go, go through it. It can even be done manually quite, uh, quite easily. The same if you have few services on top, you don't have much to monitor and to see if things are breaking with the new version or, or if, something, if anything goes wrong. But in our case especially, we tend to have more clusters. So the fleet is growing a bit. So it's harder to actually put some schedules which are following uh, the, the upgrade in order. And we also have quite a few services on top. I think today we manage more than 100 services on top of our clusters. Sometimes they're co correlated on the same cluster, sometimes they're split on different clusters. So it's not a mess, but it's, there is a various, um, various cases that are happening there. And also sometimes, in some cases, it's not really our case, but we do have this in some sibling teams. Uh, they want to regroup clusters a bit in some kind of um, functional grouping, let's say, and have some dependencies between them. For example, here we have Canary and QE and like a main cluster, a uh, main set of clusters. So we want to upgrade Canary clusters before the main ones. You could have some channel differences like fast and stable. So you want to upgrade, I mean, the fast clusters will go uh, on the upgrade first. Or you have some region deployments, like if you have an application that is deployed in multiple regions and clusters on those regions, maybe you want a region that is not used very much to be upgraded first so that there is less plus regions, and then upgrade the, the other ones later on. So that's a kind of grouping of clusters. And you want to do this all the time. You want to get the latest version as fast as you can so that you're well supported, have the latest bug fixes and features. So that's a continuous uh, upgrade process that we need to put in place. Hello. And as, as I said, it's, it's easy for one cluster to do things manually or for few clusters, like you upgrade, then you go to the next one and next one, maybe even manually. But it doesn't scale with, with a lot of clusters, a lot of services you want to check, and, and this volume of, uh, of workload, it, it's no, it doesn't scale at all. And clusters can come and go as well. You, you may want to treat them as cattle and not as pets. So you don't want to, to have the sequence very hard-coded uh, for your cluster upgrades. S and services as well uh, come and go. So you, can, you cannot really predict which service will be on which cluster tomorrow. So it can be a bit hard to, to manage. And the rules change. So you may want to adapt those rules. If you have it hard-coded, it's hard to like, get in, in the good order in the list and, and, and things like that. So as I said, we have, uh, in our case, we have a lot of clusters. 
So I'm talking about uh, in our team we have more like 40 to 50 clusters that we manage, but in uh, in our SD, uh, service delivery uh, organization we have like 200 and something. So it's it's becoming quite a lot uh, that uh, that that has to be managed. And same for services, of course. The more clusters we have, the more services we have on top. It grows even even larger than that. And as I said, we want to upgrade as soon as we can to new versions. So we upgrade very frequently, like each cluster gets upgraded once a week, once every two weeks at least. On 250 clusters, that makes a lot of upgrades. On our side, we rely on OCM to, to manage clusters. OCM is for OpenShift Cluster Manager, um, because we're using managed OpenShift from, from Red Hat. But the everything we say could apply actually to uh, to any uh, Kubernetes cluster provider. Actually, it could be EKS, AKS, as long as you have a few set of uh, items. Um, you need to know the current version of the cluster. So usually that's also an API call. You need to know which versions are available to upgrade to. So what are the available upgrade paths? And then you need to be able to trigger the upgrade. And all of this usually is, pro is provided by any cluster provider. On OCM, we currently have supported two types of, uh, of upgrades uh, by, by default. The automatic upgrades, which is just set a cron, cron tab like uh, schedule, and it will try to upgrade at that time to the latest available uh, version. And manual upgrades, it means you just do an API call or in a UI you click on a box and it does the upgrade. Those are the two only things that are available in OCM today. And OCM focuses on individual clusters. So even if in your organization you have multiple clusters, you have to do that once per each cluster. So that was kind of the problem statement where we are coming from. And now Gerd is going to explain a bit how we try to improve that. Okay, so as you saw, Patrick laid down the problem statement quite well and I have to tell you the struggle was real. For a long time we did the cluster upgrades manually, as long as the fleet was manageable that was okay, but it, it grew quite a bit and um, it was really um, becoming toily to keep these cluster upgrades uh, coming in uh, on a frequent basis. So we needed, we had to do something at SREs, what do you do if you have toil? You try to get rid of it, you try to automate the way. And uh, that's what we did with um, a tool. We built ourselves advanced upgrade service. This is not something we sell. This is just something we use within our team. Um, but the ideas we are going to show you can be applied to your systems as well. Not even It doesn't have to be cluster upgrades. We will look in into that a little bit later on. Um, so as Patrick said, OCM focuses on single clusters. But we needed something that does something on the on the um, actual uh, cluster fleet uh, level. So let's have a look at a couple of ideas we implemented and integrated into that tooling. Um, the first thing is that if you upgrade clusters, it's, it's always never just about the cluster. It's around, it, it's also about the, the services you're actually running. And um, the cluster and its version and all the operators and the APIs and, and, and so on that are on the cluster, they impact the, the services running on the clusters. And the other way around also the service, how it's leveraging the resources of the cluster, it's impacting the cluster. So when you are um, upgrading clusters, you always need to keep this workload uh, aspect in mind. So this is a very core design principle of AUS, that the workloads are important. It's not just the clusters. So we did something like this. So usually if you have multiple clusters and multiple stages, stage integration production, your software flows through those stages. And so do our cluster upgrades. So we have clusters with multiple services on it and uh, we, we progress cluster upgrades and we try to follow th these upgrades and align these upgrades with the upgrade uh, rollout paths of the services we manage. And uh, that means that um, we are not only uh, letting the flow of cluster upgrades um, um, flow the same path as the services, but we are also collecting confidence and we are collecting how the cluster upgrades and the service are, do are doing on each cluster individually, on each level individually, uh, and in on each workload on this cluster individually. And having those different workloads running on different clusters intertwined also 
allows us to gain a lot of confidence, figuring out what services go well with what operators and so on. So uh, it's, it's a really crucial and important thing that we don't just have a look at the cluster, how it's doing after an upgrade, but also having a look at the uh, services themselves. I mentioned confidence. Um, so when you do cluster upgrades at this automation level, you, need, you, you can't have a look at each cluster and each workload individually after each upgrade. You need to find some other way of gaining confidence and driving the automation. And that's what we're doing with currently with uh, two aspects mainly, namely um, cluster health based on telemeter. That's a system. If you have an open shift cluster, you are actually feeding telemetry data into it. It's a Red Hat service. It's not only for managed services, or for, but also for all the connected open shift, all the connected OCP clusters. And since we are SREs, we, we manage the services on the clusters as well. We have SLIs and SLOs defined for those services. So if you want to know how a service is doing, we have those numbers. We can have a look at them. And what we are doing is we are, if we see that those numbers are degrading, we, we know that confidence is not too high that we should proceed with a cluster upgrade. At least we need to have a look uh, what is the reason for the degraded SLOs or for degraded cluster uh, upgrade. Is it related to the latest upgrade with it? Is it not? And based on that, we can decide how to go uh, further. Um, one situation can be that we see, okay, a cluster upgrade is really not doing that well for us. We really consume cluster upgrades very early on. We try to be customer zero. That means for certain clusters, we are even consuming release candidates. For other classes, we are using the fast um, channel, not, not only the stable channel, but also the fast channel. So we are really one of the first ones to know if something uh, is not going well with a kind of workload. Um, so occasionally, we need to block versions. And um, yeah, that, that's also something really important if you do cluster upgrades like this. If you notice something, you need to immediately uh, act and uh, block versions. Um, I said confidence a couple of times, but how do we actually um, track this confidence? And we have a concept that's called soak days. Uh, and it's basically our way of declaratively define um, confidence. So we basically upgrade a cluster, and um, then we look at our health, telemetry, or, or, or SLIs, SLOs, and we have a look how it's, how it's going. And if everything's healthy, we start to collect this confidence, this soak days. So we let that version soak for a while. And we are uh, increasing the soak day counter for workload cluster version combinations. And that lets us um, gain a number of, it's, it's like a counter that increases. How long was everything fine? And that's our way of uh, tracking the confidence, the amount of time workloads run healthy on a cluster with a specific version. So how does that look like? So for example, in the epicenter of a um, cluster version hitting our first clusters, with, which require low confidence, we have a soak day zero definition. So every version that's coming in may it be a release candidate, may it be something like that. We are consuming it. And then we are having a look how are the services and the clusters doing. And if it's, if it's going well, then uh, absolutely nice. We increased this confidence counter over time. A day later, um, we saw that we see that two clusters are defined to be happy with one soak day of confidence. So these clusters will get the upgrade as well. Then maybe a day later, we collected more confidence, but we are still not there yet for cluster D because that's a cluster that requires maybe a little bit more confidence. It's running maybe a production service of ours that really can't um, be down. So not yet after day two, we are going to upgrade that cluster. But maybe on day three, because collectively all those three clusters have been upgraded already. And all these clusters running the same workload as cluster D, they provided enough confidence for us to just go for it and upgrade cluster D. Um, but sometimes you don't Sorry, <laughs> that's, that's, Patrick, that's um, So we explain we have we are workload centric, so we are counting those soak days with a pair workload. We explain that we can block versions, but we so we were fine for with that for for a while actually for I think almost one year we had only that. But then we had some additional 
constraints that were coming in because we wanted to expose this kind of facility to other teams in, uh, in Red Hat. And they had other scenarios. One of them is that they, didn't, they have multiple clusters to run the same workload, let's say in production, and they want to have only one cluster upgraded at once, like at, 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 at a given time. So we implemented what we call mutex, which means that only one cluster holding that mutex can happen at any given time. So when one cluster is scheduled or upgrading to a version, the other ones which, have, which share the same mutex cannot. So they are just standing by, and they will wait for the next schedule. So how does it look like? We have currently here cluster B and C sharing the same mutex, mutex H. It's just a string that we define in our cluster uh, upgrade policy definition. And so cluster B just holds that mutex. So it's, it's currently upgrading or scheduled to upgrade. And cluster uh, C is waiting for the mutex to be available in order to start the upgrade. It's quite simple, but it's actually saving quite a lot of time as well. Then we went a bit further, and when we have those large fleets uh, of clusters which uh, span multiple regions for a given service and, and need to be upgraded also progressively, so the idea is to upgrade um, less sensitive regions first and then progress towards uh, the, the end of the, of the flow, we implemented what we call sectors. So in the case of regions, one sector could be one region, but you can think of Canary and Maine, or you can think of the, the various channels that I was talking about before. Um, and basically, all the clusters in, in the first sector need to be upgraded to at least that version, so that it's considered for the next sector. So, basic, so the version N would have to be applied on all the clusters in the first sector before it's being used for the, for the next one. Let, let's, see, see, let's see this in action a bit. So here, those clusters are not in any sectors, but the last ones, let's say that there are multiple regions, and they're regrouped into what is called a sector. So all the clusters in the sector one are going to be upgraded first, and once they're all upgraded, the, cl the clusters in sector two will be able to upgrade to this version. And we do that by just grouping them into those sectors. So again, we just give them the name of the sector, and we define the sector dependency in a, in a separate configuration. OK, as you can imagine, if you have a fleet that's big enough, so hundreds of clusters, uh, if you're following what we've shown, um, a cluster upgrade is not something you do in five minutes. Um, you need to imagine that cluster upgrades also come in on a weekly basis. So there is a really good chance that you're not able to upgrade your entire fleet to a specific version before the next one comes in. So not even close. So if the fleet is big enough, it might take weeks until you have the, the required confidence you to actually upgrade your, your most precious clusters. So that's something you need to deal with. So in this scenario, for example, we have version one that, uh, that's coming in. And the most inner clusters, the one with the, the lowest confidence requirement, they upgrade immediately. And then after a while, while we gain more confidence, we can upgrade more clusters and more clusters. And then before we even can finish this version, a next one comes in, version two. And it also works its way through our clusters, but then all of a sudden we detect that there is a problem with it, a bug, whatever. We need to decide to block this upgrade. So it's not going to spread further. Um, but luckily version three to the rescue, it's going to fix the bug and it's going to fix our clusters as well, and, and so on and so on. And even before version three uh, is reaching uh, the end of the, uh, the outer ring of the clusters, version four is, is coming in and they happily ever after upgrade. So that, that's just the, the way it is. I think at times we have six, seven versions that are soaking through our fleet of clusters. That is fine, it's just how it is. So a quick recap. Um, so what you saw so far were concepts. So we've, um, we've built some policy framework around it. So it's not that we decide what clusters uh, are upgraded at what point in time. We define what are the requirements for a cluster being ready to be upgraded. So is there enough confidence in this version already for this kind of workload? Is a cluster running Quay uh, ready to be upgraded? Yes, if there have been a lot of stage Quay clusters that are running this version flawlessly for a couple of weeks, great, then we can do the upgrade. 
So we have this um, internal system, how we manage uh, not only clusters, but also services and everything. And there's been an enhancement. We can de de uh, declare policies in a very declarative way. You can see something we didn't discuss. There's a schedule in there as well, for example, because there are some requirements. We don't upgrade clusters out on weekend because we don't have anyone uh, who wants to take care of that at that point in time. It's not also necessary. Then um, we can define what services are running on a cluster. That's very easy for us because we have this declarative system for service management as well. We have the blocked versions in there. We have all the conditions. We talked about mutexes, sectors, soak days, and so on. Uh, all the gating mechanisms we talked about. So this, this works really nice for us. Um, so now we have AUS for two and a half years now, roughly, or two yeah. years. It's a massive toil reduction. So we don't even think about set stream updates anymore. They just, they just happen. Minor upgrades, they're, they're usually a bit, a bit more involved because you need to do some investigation, more planning about APIs being deprecated, operators need to be upgraded beforehand and so on. Um, but what we learned as well from this entire project is that the concepts we've identified, they work very well for other systems as well. It's not just about cluster upgrades. It's also about, um, you can do everything that needs, needs upgrades and everything that uh, provides a certain amount of uh, metadata is very well suited for it. So as long as you have a system that provides version data, current version data, upgrade paths and health informations, these idea can, ideas can be applied. And we do so currently. As I said, we are SREs, we do the progressive service delivery and, and, and stuff like that as well. We are applying that to, uh, the, these ideas to that as well. It's implemented right now. Is it already it's in use? It's not being used yet, but it's next week. Yeah, soak days for um, service, progressive service delivery. That's really nice. And we have some other ideas as well. So we use a lot of databases. So obviously they need upgrades as well. And uh, for example, in the for RDS databases on AWS, you have all those informations you have as well. You know how are they, how are they doing health-wise. Obviously, you need to pull in SLIs and SLOs from the services using the database as well. But you have upgrade paths in the current version as well. So the, all, everything we've seen here can be applied to uh, database upgrades as well. Yeah. So. Any final words? <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. If, uh, if you have any questions, we are open for them, of course. Um, so do you communicate uh, some maintenance to your customers? Because basically, as I saw, this is all automated and it can happen any time. Um. So from the start, actually, we've been pretty good at this, that cluster upgrades are normal things that should happen all the time. And services are told that their pods may move during an upgrade, and that's fine. Their pods need to support moving. Uh, so that's, that's the ground rule for any service that we run on our clusters. They should not block any upgrade or maintenance on the, on the underlying infrastructure. So they, they know that it can, it can happen anytime. Actually, they have access to the, to the configuration. And uh, yeah, I'm repeating the question, sorry. <laughs> so the question was about um, our ser the, the services that run on our clusters. Um, do, do we need to let them know when a cluster upgrade is happening or not, so that if any impact they can look at it? But no, so it's really like we are doing upgrades pretty much whenever we want. They have access to this configuration in our configuration tool, uh, and there are also some notifications in Slack or in, in, in messages like that, so they can they can see uh, that that this is happening, but. It, they're told that it's really normal to upgrade and it, we should upgrade uh, very frequently. So we have good customers, they're understanding. Yes? Um, what do you do if large parts of your fleet are soaking and something to the effect of half being hit? And something of what? Sorry? To the effect of half being hit, the OPS is actually prior to the or something of uh, um, comparable to that. Well, in this case, um, so I repeat the question. <laughs> so what's happening if a large, a large part of the fleet is soaking a version and that we uh, bug like uh, the OpenSSL bug uh, that was discovered recently is, uh, is happening? 
I think we just blocked that version because we don't want to propagate it to new clusters and especially to later ones. And we just wait for the next fix actually because there is not much we can do, except if there is a workaround or a hot fix that we can apply. We just, uh, we just wait for the next fix actually. We are um, about to implement something to address that because part of the fleet might have already been upgraded and um, as shown, so if, if we do automatic upgrades, it might take a while until we gain confidence for a, a fixed version. We are implementing something to speed up upgrades. We call it the fast path, where we um, yeah, shortcut on the confidence a bit in, for the sake of security, because something like Harpley that it's re can really be a disaster. Um, so there is a fast path uh, feature we are working on where we can define a certain minimum version all the cluster need to be while we still try to adhere to all the other rules like mute access sectors and, and, and stuff like that. What we are doing is basically we are applying a scale down factor on the required uh, confidence, on the required soak days. Just to add on, I'll come to you. The, we currently we don't have this feature, we're working on it. But what we, what we can do today is manual upgrades. This is still, this is still feasible for us actually because the, the system will just see, okay, an upgrade is ongoing. I'll block my mutex, uh, my sectors, and so on. We'll follow that up, but we can still upgrade manually, and that can also speed up the process today. Yes? The question is, so you have the soap days, and uh, the loop, how do you manage them? I mean, in the beginning, maybe soap days were like 30 days, and then you cut it to 15, and so on. So do you follow any rules there, or what's, uh, what do you absorb? Like, do you shorten them, or they always stay the same? What's happening with them? Won't take it. Um, I mean, soak days are sub subject. Uh, uh, so the question was, how do we manage soak days? How do we um, do we reduce them? Do we increase them? Do we adapt them? Um, yes, we do. So there are um, scenarios where we see that we might need a little bit more soak days for certain clusters. So uh, we move cluster f uh, further away from the center of where a version is uh, first being released. It's, it's configuration. It's in a configuration tool. We, we might change it at any time. Also, our customers can, um, can actually bring in just a pull request to this configuration, and we adapt and change. But what do you observe? I mean, uh, they are shortening or they stay the same? It depends on the complexity of the workload or of the version of the cluster or like any patterns there? Well, actually, we, we did change them from time a uh, few times, but not very often, because what this represents really is the confidence we have in the version. So if we set like 30 upsoc days, it means that this application, to, to the workload or the workloads that are working on this cluster, need to have run at least 30, 30 days on any other clusters. So the confidence, this is really a confidence factor. So we, we imagine that 30 days is enough to have confidence for this workload. If we think that we need more or less, uh, we can change it. But honestly, we didn't change them so often. Maybe at the beginning for some tweaking, but uh, not, not much more than that. The tooling is also uh, exposing a lot of metrics. So we have a lot of dashboards where we can observe how it's overall doing and if something needs tweaking. So it's metric driven as well. So the question was, do all the services we run, the workloads we run, need um, multiple stages for their cluster? So integration, stage production? The answer is yes. So we, we require that. Um, that's just a meaningful thing to do. Um, also, um, in, in general, for SREing services. Yeah, so, so the question is around blocking versions and is it uh, automated or manual? So today it's, it's manual fully because we don't know actually if it's the, the... When an issue occurs, we have an incident. So we're investigating if it's the service that has an issue or if it's the underlying cluster and the upgrade that happened. At that point, we immediately block the version. Then that's the pull request we do with just adding the, the line or the regex in the blocked version list. And so currently it's manual, yes. 
but since it's coming from an incident, there is someone looking at this, so that's quite easy. Also, uh, degrading SLOs from services, they show up with us accessories so we can react properly. I can't hear you. Can you hear? The question was, I, um, let me know. Um, the question was, is this tooling open source? Um, yes, it is. It might not be that easy to use right now because it's ri integrated into our way of doing configuration management. Um, that's why we mostly show the ideas and the concepts and not the code and the actually the, the service in action. But the concepts on themselves are really not complicated, and building any tool that does that with, with your cluster provider is, really is quite, uh, quite easy, actually. Yeah, so contract reconcile, so the, the tool is called contract reconcile. Indeed, that's the, the overall tooling that we use in APSRI that manages like cluster upgrades, but also service rollouts, uh, RDS databases, Slack, uh, Slack groups. I mean, it, there is a lot of APIs. That I think we have 150 integrations or something like that. Um, so yes, that's the whole bunch of things. And within that, there is AUS, which controls the cluster upgrades. So any other user than Apacery? We have other users within the service delivery group in, uh, in Red Hat. So for example, we take care of the Hypershift clusters, so the, the management clusters that run Hypershift today. We control them, all their upgrades with, uh, with AUS. So the ones hosting the control planes. Uh, but also other projects, so this is not the only one, but we, we have currently 250-ish clusters under management. So the, the question is about blocking versions when one workload specifically on, on one cluster has an issue. Uh, do we block it for this workload only or for the whole fleet? Currently, the blocking is at two levels. So we can block versions uh, on the organization level, so for all clusters, or we can block them per cluster. Um, so what we would do if we don't want to block the other workload is to block only the clusters of that workload later down the, ch down the chain. Uh, I think it was in the, in the example YAML here, you see that this block version is in the upgrade policy of one cluster. It also exists at the organization layer, so that it applies to everything. Um, or we could, we could just block it, and if the guys are fast enough to fix, and if we can wait for the next day, we can just block the version for other one as well. We do because we are quite early adopters. We, we try to use the, as, as fast as we can the Redis candidates of OpenShift. So of course, it can be a bit flaky. So we kind of the first real users using those versions. Um, so we do have some issues from time to time, especially when we go to minor versions, like bump from uh, XY versions. Uh, so from time to time, yes, we, we, do, we do block uh, those upgrades. After, during the patch, uh, patch releases, honestly, we don't have many problems, uh, so it's just like, usually we don't block them. It's very, very rare that we block them. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.